This is the FET Neon Lights and Other Discharge Lamps Simulator. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the FET simulators that runs on uh, a Java platform, and if your security settings on your computer won't allow you to do the experiments, the purpose of this video is to walk through the questions uh, and activities on the sheet that accompanies this activity. So as it says on that handout, uh, you can begin by exploring the one atom panel. There's a multiple atoms too, but we're actually going to mostly confine uh, what we're looking at here to the one atom panel. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can do here. So uh, these are the charged plates, and you can configure this to fire one electron at a time. So the simulator is going to show that uh, with a little dot moving left to right, though I can switch the battery polarity here. Uh, and then fire an electron from the other side. Uh, I can change the voltage of the battery or the orientation of the battery. So we showed the orientation there, but there's a slider bar. And you'll note that over on this side, it's changing how much uh, energy that electron will have at collision concurrent with changing the battery voltage. So if I make a higher battery voltage, the electron is going to have more energy when it collides with that single atom in the middle of our simulated discharge lamp. You can uh, specify what kind of uh, atom to study. So right now the default here is the hydrogen atom. Uh, you can actually move this atom around in the discharge tube and put it wherever you want to. Uh, and uh, you can make a configurable atom. So if you don't choose anything found in nature, just say, hey, I want to configure this. You can decide how many energy levels you want this thing to have and, and assign those energy levels different uh, values and slide those around. So we're actually going to start with this configurable, configurable excuse me, uh, and the easiest possible setting would be a, an atom that has two energy levels. So uh, I've done two, and so I guess two can be anywhere here. I'm also going to uh, turn on the spectrometer, and this is going to give me a, a visual of the color of any sort of photon that I produce uh, in this interaction. So um, notice that, well, let's try to move this back, I guess, to default if I'm in the center. Um, if I fire an electron, here and note that the when the electron collides it's going to have less energy than the energy of the second energy level uh, nothing happens but if i increase the battery voltage or alternately move uh, the atom closer to the plate um, so that the electron travels further and speeds up more across this electric field i'll, I'll get this energy at collision to be above the energy level here so let's see what happens differently when that happens. We fire an electron, and you'll notice that momentarily it's absorbed by the atom here in the center. It shows that it jumps up to the second energy level by that little two in the center. Uh, and then when it jumps back down, there's a photon that is given off uh, in a random direction. So we can see this. And we note that no matter what we do here, we are always giving off a photon with the same wavelength, and they're showing up and counted down here at around the 330 nanometer mark. If I prefer, I could you know, fire them in a continuous stream, and I would continue to generate the same uh, types of photons. So there's some true and false statements to respond to here. True or false, if the spacing between two electronic energy levels in atom A is larger than in atom B, then the wavelength of the light emitted by atom B will be longer. Okay, so let's try this. Let's, does it give me a reset button? Ah, reset our spectrometer here. And uh, atom A, okay, spacing between atom A and atom B. So atom A, if we start here with this energy level and we fire, we get a wavelength down here at again about 330. Now if atom A is larger in spacing than atom B, let's go ahead and make atom B a lower energy level and fire an electron here. 
it gets absorbed and we get a photon and note that that photon here is about 550 nanometers. So what does this tell us? Uh, when the spacing between two electronic energy levels in atom A is larger than in atom B, then the wavelength of the light emitted by atom B will be longer. That statement's true. This was atom B that we just simulated and we indeed got a longer wavelength of light. If the spacing between two electronic energy levels in atom A is smaller than in atom B, then fewer photons will be emitted by atom B. All right, spacing between two levels in A is smaller than B. So we'll go ahead and reset our spectrometer. And uh, we'll just call this atom A's configuration. And I'm going to go ahead and fire 10 electrons here. And there's the uh, photons that I produced uh, for atom A. Now, if atom B has a larger energy spacing, so I move this second level to a higher level, and let's go ahead and fire uh, 10 here at our hypothetical atom B. And note, no. The answer to this is false. I get just as many photons, providing, of course, that the energy level at the collision uh, is above the top energy level of either of those configured atoms. Third statement, true or false, photons are emitted as electrons in the atom jump up in energy. Uh, so is that true? Well, slow motion might help us here. Let's watch and see if we can tell when the photon gets emitted. So here comes the electron. Now in slow motion, it gets absorbed by the atom. And notice that the photon that comes out of there is not emitted until the atom is transitioning back to the lower energy level. So energy is absorbed, but it's only in the transition back to the lower energy level that the photon is emitted, making that statement false. And the fourth statement in this little cluster, true or false, the colors emitted by an atom depend on how much kinetic energy the free electron has when it hits the atom. Let's go ahead and reset so we don't get this uh, mixed up too much. I'm just going to make a random atom here, and I'm going to fire. Oh, we're still in slow motion. Let's take slow motion off. There we go. All right, so I'm getting photons that have a wavelength of just over 600 nanometers here. Can I change the kinetic energy and therefore see if that changes the color of photons that I emit? Well, the answer is yes. If I want them to have less kinetic energy, I could turn down the battery voltage a little bit. As long as I keep this energy at collision above energy level 2, and we'll go ahead and fire a few more electrons here. And what we notice when we do so is that we get the exact same wavelength and exact same color of photons that is emitted here. So the answer to that last statement in this cluster is false. The, ener the colors emitted by the atom depend on the difference between these two energy levels, but not how actual and much kinetic energy the electrons have at the collision, again, providing they have a high enough kinetic energy to make this transition happen. All right, and then it says to be able to answer the remainder of the questions might be useful to change the number of electrons that are being fired, the number of energy levels in the atom, and or the position of the atom in the discharge tube. So, true or false, do the colors depend on the number of free electrons passing through the uh, lamp? So here I've got a continuous stream of electrons, and I'm getting a certain color. If I crank it up to give a lot more electrons, do the colors depend? And so the answer, at least at this stage, is no. Um, but there's an interesting tweak you can do to this. So I'm going to go ahead and reset this and turn this off. What happens if I introduce a third energy level? And I put the third energy level so that the electrons when they collide let's go here 
have enough energy to kick me up to level two, but not uh, to level three. Well, then I'm going to notice the transitions are always up to two, down to one. But what happens if we hit the atom when it's in state two with another electron? So I think we see that best if we do this continuously. So we're always going up to two here, but what if we crank up our electrons? Well, it's not hitting fast enough to do what I hoped we might be able to do. Oh, there we go. Notice that occasionally when these are cranked up fast enough, an electron is going to hit this thing when it's already in state two and knock it up to state three, and then the transition from state three back down to state two, or transition from state three back down to state one, are producing these other photons that are in the infrared and ultraviolet uh, bands of the system here. So when there are multiple energy levels, it can get a little bit more complicated. The statement, uh, true or false, when a free electron hits an atom, the atom is always excited to the highest energy level possible. Well, let's turn this way down and test that hypothesis. So slow pace of atoms, and I'm going to put uh, the battery voltage up so that these electrons are hitting with more energy. Does it always go up to the highest energy level possible? Well, it has enough energy to transition to level three, but you'll notice many times when it hits, it transitions only to level two uh, and then back to one. But other times it goes up to three, down to two and down to one, or up to three and then directly down to one. And all of those differences in energy correspond to different kinds of photons that are being produced uh, within this simulated atom. True or false, the kinetic energy of the free electron at the point of collision increases as the voltage of the battery increases. Well, we've already seen that in several of these. If I rank, uh, crank up the voltage of the battery, this energy at collision goes up as well. There's a faster acceleration through this electric field, and the electrons will hit the atom with higher speed. Kinetic energy of the free electron at the point of collision is higher if the atom is closer to the source of electrons. So if we take this atom and take it closer to the source of electrons, notice at some point at least what happens to my energy slider over on the right. That energy is dropping. These electrons have had less space to increase their speed. And so right here, if I'm really close to that plate, uh, I don't even have enough energy to jump up to an excited state at all. If I'm here, I'll jump up to state two when the uh, electron is absorbed, but not state three. And I've got to get over here before state three is accessible in this particular system. So that statement is false. The kinetic energy is actually lower the closer the atom is. And conversely, if you go further away, they are really going fast by the time they hit, and uh, they are higher energy electrons uh, at that stage. True or false, the only way to emit Infrared photons is if there are empty electronic energy levels really close to the ground state or the lowest energy level. All right, well, let's go back and just make this two and uh, turn down our battery voltage a little bit, clear our little spectrometer. And what happens if I'm down here and really close Then I have a small energy gap, and you'll notice every time I'm hit in that small energy gap and it absorbs and goes up to level two and then decays back to level one, I'm emitting one of these photons, and these photons are long wavelength photons over here on the infrared part of the spectrum. Now, is that the only way to emit infrared photons? Uh, and the answer is actually no. So I'm going to stop counting and reset my counter here for a minute put level two up here uh, and introduce a third level again so that level two and level three are energetically close to each other, but level two and level one are kind of far away from each other. Uh, and then turn back my counter and see what I'm getting. So again, now I've got enough kinetic energy hitting these atoms that they can absorb and jump up to level three. 
and then it could transition back down to level two and then to one, or it could jump up to three and then back down to one directly. So lots of different events, and you'll notice that with three energy possibilities, going from two down to one, going from three down to two, or going from three directly to one, I'm actually producing three different um, photons and one of them uh, corresponding to the small energy transition from going from three to two is on the infrared part of the spectrum. So that technically that statement is false. Uh, you can uh, emit infrared photons as long as there's any energy gaps within the system that are small energy gaps. Final true and false statement, when atomic electrons are excited to a highest level, higher level rather, they always return to their lowest energy level by jumping down one level at a time. Well, right here, this is evidence that that statement is false as well. If that were true, we'd always go up to level three and then down to level two and then down to level one. If that were the case, we would only see two different kinds of photons, those whose energy corresponds to the three to two transition and those whose energy corresponds to the two to one transition. But because we actually see three different kinds of photons, there must be occasions where we get a direct three to one transition uh, to produce that third kind of photon. So those were the true and false statements. Uh, you can see this with multiple atoms, which is a more realistic simulation of what's happening uh, within a discharge tube. But it is, of course, a little bit busier to look at. This happens to be a uh, simulation of a hydrogen lamp with six energy states and uh, lots of stuff going on there in terms of the production. What I will point out here though is this is kind of what you see uh, if you look at actual hydrogen spectrum. So here's the spectrometer and you'll notice that all of these possible energy transitions correspond to a series of different colored bands. So you're never going to see the ultraviolet or the infrared here. But you should be able to observe a, a couple of bands that are on the blue to violet portion of the spectrum, one that's sort of in between blue and green, uh, and then one that's over on the red side of the spectrum when you have hydrogen. Uh, if you have instead mercury, things will reset here. Mercury's got at least nine accessible energy levels here. And again, I get a whole bunch of UV and one infrared, but I get some other unique color bands here, some purple, some blue, this is gonna test my red-green color blindness, uh, some yellows and greens in the middle here. And so uh, each element actually has a unique color spectrum and a unique signature, if you will, uh, which is um, helpful in, in helping you as a scientist decide you know, what the heck it is that you're seeing. Here's sodium. Sodium produces a lot in that yellow part of the spectrum, and there's a lot also in the orange, and uh, everything else is kind of in the infrared, or there's one down there in the ultraviolet. And uh, here is neon, finally. And the neon spectrum gives you lots of reds and yellows, which in combination uh, give you that classic neon look. So those wavelengths are 550, oh, 585, 590 something, uh, and then several that are between 600 and 700 uh, nanometers of wavelength. So that's it for the discharge lamp simulator. Again, hopefully you didn't have to watch this video and you were able to play around with it by yourself, but if not, uh, hopefully this was an aid to answering the questions regarding the discharge lamps.